see. Okay. So I'm not sure we are recording. So if it's not live on Facebook, then it will be recorded. So today is Sunday, October the 11th. I'm Shirley Banks. For those of you, you probably know me, but in case this video gets shared, I'm Shirley Banks on Facebook, Food Girl 29 on Instagram. And we're talking today with Miss Atia. And we're going to be doing an interview on um, COVID and COVID survival. And this young lady here survived COVID. And so we're just going to be doing a quick interview on this. So it should be about 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes. This depends on what we go to get into. I'm trying to see if we're live on Facebook yet. So... It's still saying that the live is preparing, so I'm not sure why it's not going through. But anyway, we're recording, so let's let's get started. Okay, so okay. Um, I'm just going to give you some updates. And I looked at this data like this morning in preparation for this. And mm -hmm. um, let's see here. I guess I erased it too as well when I looked it up. But we know COVID is still going fairly strong here in the U.S. It's something that has impacted the nation not only here in the U.S., but it's impacted the world. And here in the U.S. collectively, we've had over 200,000 deaths um, related to COVID. And so no, we recently in our news here, we know some high profile people here in the U.S. Um, were diagnosed with COVID and they got some um, treatments that sometimes typically are not geared towards the normal everyday person who experienced COVID. So Miss Atia is here with us and she's gonna share her COVID story. So we're gonna be doing a few question and answering just to kind of see what her process looked like, um, what she went through and what her message is. Now, we were talking a little bit before we got started and this young lady represents the millennial. So it was the first um, interview we did with COVID survival, we had a Gen X person on talking about um, her process. So now we have a millennial. And so we know in the beginning when a lot of the COVID information came out that there was not concerns for the millennials. There was not even concern for the young people. It was mostly like, oh, it's going to be the older generation. So I think young people may have thought, I don't have to worry about this. That's not my issue. Unless like, you know, you're living with grandma or grandpa and you don't want to get them sick. So, um, she lives in the Georgia area. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm in the DMV, which is the kind of the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. So she's coming to us live and then live in color. So welcome, Miss Atia. Hello. Say hello, greet the people. Hey, you guys. <laughs> so as I said, she represents the millennials. And um, as we're coming, I started doing this series because as we're coming into the fall and winter season, we know that COVID um, is going to be combined with the possibilities of colds, flus, allergies, all of those things. And so sometimes you're trying to figure out, is it, a, is it my allergies messing up? Is it just a cold? Is it COVID? Is it the flu? You know, or some people say, is it the Rona? Rona, is that you? We don't know sometimes, but yep. there are some differentiating symptoms. And we'll do that in another live that kind of tells us about what could be some of the major difference between like say the flu and allergies versus COVID, okay? And we know that uh, even though, um, I guess it depends on where you are in the country, where you go and once you start to feel some symptoms, whether you're in South Carolina, Georgia, DC, Maryland, Virginia, New York, wherever, you could have a different response when you go to the ER or to your PCP office. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit today too. So tell me, we know you're a millennial, what is your occupation? I am a medical receptionist and a medical biller for an urgent care. So you are an urgent, you work in an urgent care. So you're seeing a lot of people yes. that could be a potential carrier for COVID-19, flus, and everything, right? Yes. So that could That's be, you work in a high work. exposure area. So you work in a high exposure area. And that's, that's where, where you, I get it from. That's where it came from. Wow. Yep. So describe your health prior to getting COVID. 
Um, I'm a type two diabetic and I have blood pressure issues. So I really wasn't too worried about it at first when we first was told about COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, we got the word at work and I literally was like, okay, if you get it, you get it. That, that was my whole theory, my whole point right then and there. So I wasn't really too worried about it when they started telling us we had to wear a mask. And I was like, I'm not wearing no mask. It's hot in that thing. <laughs> so I literally would say that I'm not wearing no mask. It's hot under those things. I'm not doing that mm -hmm. until I got sick. So now I did your, you said now you were telling them that you weren't going to wear a mask. Did they enforce yeah, it? Or did they enforce no, they didn't it at all? Enforce it. They basic, no, they basically said it was recommended that we wear them. I was like, well, we're not enforcing them now, so why do I got to wear one? Okay. It wasn't so mandatory at that point. It wasn't mandatory. So you, and you felt like, this is something I'm not re even really concerned about right now. You know? But I you, literally would, would tell them that. I wasn't worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> so even though you had some health challenges as your own, as a millennial, you said type 2 diabetic and uh, yes. what else is and I, hypertension? Uh, hypertension. Okay. Yes. So those are two major risk factors for those of you who don't know. They're high risk factors for not getting COVID, but for the, the outcome with COVID. Those are higher risk factors. Um, and then yes. plus you are a woman of color, you're black and brown like me. So we tend to have lower vitamin D levels. And we had, according to some of the studies that I've read and some of the things that have come out, we have higher mortality rates. So, but I understand, you know, coming from millennial, you know, this is not something that really concern me. They're not gonna make me wear these masks. You know, as a nurse for many years, I've had to be in masks and protective equipment, being around yeah. certain, um, and it, it can be uncomfortable. You know, like most, a lot of people complain about just going in the grocery store with a mask, but imagine being in a room for four hours with a mask on and trying to, um, you know, you know, do everything you need to do. So you weren't worried about it, but your contact point was because you work in a high, a urgent care. And an urgent care, for those of you who may not know, is similar to kind of like an ER, but on a smaller scale. So when people, you know, like fall, they hurt themselves, they feel bad, instead of going to the ER or if the doctor's yeah. office is closed, they go to the urgent care. So it can be, a, it's, that is a high um, contact point right there. So um, around March, it became terrible. We March. started seeing an influx, yeah, uh -huh. an influx of all the people worried about Corona, and then they wanted to be tested for it, and they just feared that they had it. Mm -hmm. Now, and were you guys testing at your center or no? We hadn't started testing there yet. You hadn't started testing there yet. And then when we did yet. start, yeah, when we did start, it was like the nurses and the providers didn't actually want to test them because. You know, you have to go in full PPE and then you have to shut the room down for 30 minutes so it can uh, be cleaned properly. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know too much about it when it first started happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can so see that yeah, there was a, like, no. yeah, there was a lot of uh, uncertainty about what the protocol was. And we know that some of our agencies that are supposed to tell us what we should do kind of went back and forth on a couple of things on how it should be managed. So... Um, were you yes. being a diabetic and having hypertension prior to COVID, were you consistent with your medications? Was your blood pressure controlled on medication? Every what? day, every single day I take my medicine like clockwork. I take it every day before I go to work. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really too concerned about it. I'm like, oh, I'm young. So they saying the young people can't get it. So <laughs> who cares? That's day what I was like. I'm like, I'm young. I can get over this. I literally said this to the people at work. I'm young. I ain't old. <laughs> so well, you know what? This probably ain't going to affect this. <laughs> that, even though that's still like a positive confession, that was the attitude you took. Instead of being fearful, like, oh my God, you know, I have hypertension and I have diabetes and, you know, what is this going to happen to me? But your attitude was like, <laughs> I'm young. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do as far as taking care of my blood pressure. And was your blood sugar managed at that it time was. too? I literally, yeah, I okay. literally was more worried for my my mother and my aunt who are mm -hmm. you know older. 
So I was like, mm, y'all shouldn't be going to Walmart like that. I was telling them to stop going to places that they was going to. <laughs> I wasn't really worried about it. Honestly, I was still out and about without a mask on in public, just going about my merry little way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even though I work in the urgent care, it didn't scare me at first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, that's, and then, that's understandable. So you weren't really concerned about that at all. So what was your first symptoms? My very first symptoms started happening the week of April um, 10th. Mm -hmm. I started getting severe diarrhea. That was it. So I never see in my job, they make you take your temperature every morning when you mm -hmm. come in. Because they heard, you know, with COVID, you have fevers and stuff. Right. My temperature was normal. It was 98.8 and 98.4 and 98.2 every single morning. That morning wow. of the 10th, I had no fever. I was 98.2. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I ain't got no fever. But I still got severe diarrhea, like really bad. Mm -hmm. I was in the bathroom every five minutes going. Mm -hmm. So I started noticing throughout the day, I started getting a little slight cough. Nothing big. It was just like <laughs> that type stuff. Mm -hmm. So a patient had came in and he was telling, you know, the other receptionist up front that, he was having diarrhea and he had got, you know, positive testing and he was having diarrhea. And she was like, well, that's part of COVID. She had recently came back to work because she had COVID. Wow. So I'm listening to her say this. And I'm like, wait a minute, I got these symptoms. <laughs> so I literally text my boss while I was sitting there and I told her, I'm not feeling good. I need to go home today. I'm like, I'm the person that gets off at 530 anyway, and we're not busy. So can I go home? And she was like, yeah, you know, you can go home early. Mm -hmm. I get home and I turned on the air condition in the house because it, it was April. It was kind of hot. And immediately I started going downhill rapidly. Mm. Like I started experiencing chills. It was so bad so you didn't want the cover to touch you. Because mm -hmm. my body was aching so bad and I was just like, this ain't working. And then I started experiencing severe headaches, like really bad headaches to the point where I was crying because I, it, it wouldn't go away no matter what I took. Mm -hmm. I took Tylenol, it wouldn't go away. I took some ibuprofen, it finally went away when I took the ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. So it, immediately I called my mom, I said, I'm experiencing signs of COVID and I'm going to get tested today. Mm -hmm. And I think y'all should get tested too because I was just over your house the day before. Okay. So I'm like, y'all need to get tested. So I went to my job and I got tested. And she was like, well, you know, wait, you can't go back to work until you get your results or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm home patiently waiting for my results to come back and I'm getting worse by the day. Mm -hmm. I started experiencing fevers, really high temperatures. And I'm like, Oh God, I'm taking Tylenol, I'm taking ibuprofen to get the temperature down. It wasn't going down. So what did your fevers go up to? 102. Mm -hmm. So I'm literally, I, I went to the emergency room because I was feeling really bad at this point, like really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And you know, they was like, well, if you got, you know, Tremadol, you need to take some of that for the body aches and all that stuff. And she's like, just keep taking the ibuprofen or whatever. She was like, cause nine times out of 10, you, you got COVID. I still hang out my test results back. Mm -hmm. my I was sitting there sweating and it was cold. I'm like, it's hot in here. It was 65 degrees in my house and I'm sitting there sweating mm -hmm. because that's how bad the fever was. Mm -hmm. By the time I got my results back, they, they called me that Wednesday and they said, Ms. Jones, yes, you are positive for COVID. So you're going to have to stay home until you, know, you have a symptom free. I said, okay, that's no problem. By Thursday, I noticed that it was getting hard for me to breathe, like really hard for me to take deep breaths. I couldn't mm -hmm. do it. So I tried to get up and walk to the bathroom, which my apartment is pretty small. I tried to get up and walk from the bed to the bathroom and I almost passed out, mm -hmm. literally. So I said, oh, oh no, this ain't gonna work. Anytime I tried to walk, I was breathing 
hard, like really hard, trying to struggle to catch my breath. So I end up going to the emergency room again. Mm-hmm. And it was now, like, were you well, at home by you know, yourself during this period of time? Yes. I was home by myself in quarantine. Mm-hmm. By myself. Mm-hmm. So they were like, you know, we're going to do an x-ray because if you are positive for COVID, you know, we, we need to see what's going on. So they, you know, did all kind of cultures and everything. I'm like, y'all taking a lot of blood, ain't you? And she was like, yeah, we're just going to, you know, take the cultures to see what's going on. Mm-hmm. When they did the x-ray, he came back in and he's like, Miss Jones, you got double pneumonia. So from Tuesday, yeah. from Tuesday to Thursday, I developed double pneumonia. Just so let me way. ask you, so now you have pneumonia in both of your lungs. So when you went to the ER, because you were feeling bad initially, did they give you any breathing apparatus, tell you about breathing exercises yes. or anything? Did they give you an sentence barometer? Yes, they gave me, they just told me techniques that I need to you know, follow mm-hmm. to, um, to actually control my breathing when it starts to get too heavy, when I can't breathe hard. Mm-hmm. So I started doing those little techniques and they, they basically told me, don't lay on my back, okay. lay on my stomach or on my side because mm-hmm. you're gonna drown if you don't do that. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, you gotta tell me twice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I noticed like if I tried to lay on my back, it was terrible. Like I literally would start coughing and I couldn't stop coughing. Okay. So I couldn't do that. I just laid on my stomach the whole time. Mm-hmm. The whole entire time. I just laid on my stomach. And my body kept telling me, sleep, go to sleep. Mm-hmm. Just go to sleep. I would be up for probably like four hours a day. Mm-hmm. through the whole day and the rest of the time I'm asleep. So this entire time like, while you were doing all of this, having the trouble breathing, nearly almost passing out, being diagnosed with double pneumonia, you were by yourself. You had no support there physically in the house with you. I was totally by myself. Mm-hmm. My mom was at her house and I was at my house. And by this time, my mom had tested positive as well. Wow. My mom, her sister, and my niece tested positive. Mm-hmm. All three of those people were positive. So I was more sick than them. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to, they wouldn't let me come around them and I didn't want to go around them. Yeah, right. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I just stay home. So when you got the pneumonia, what was the treatment process for you then? Did they just give you antibiotics and then send you back home? Or were you ever hospitalized? They gave me, they gave me a Z-Pack another z pack and they gave me some steroids and they gave me the hydrocozone mm-hmm. um i was like i don't really want to. i started taking it the very first time i took the dosage i kind of felt a little bit better i could take a deep breath and then is as once the, as i started to take more to, is that with the z pack with, or with the steroids or with the hydrocortisone i mean the hydro um quinone the hydro those it was just this those pills i didn't take the z-pack because i had already took a z-pack oh okay so i was like i'm not gonna take the z-pack i'm not gonna take the steroids Mm -hmm. i'm just gonna see if this gonna work because i took one of the pills in the hospital and they actually made me feel a little bit better okay but as i started taking the pills i started feeling even worse Mm -hmm. like once i got home and i started taking them i started feeling even worse like i couldn't do it so I just stopped taking the pills completely. I said, I'm not taking this medicine anymore. No. So when you say worse, was it in your breathing, your energy, your fevers, your cough? What? My breathing and my energy was, and my cough were the only things that was terrible. Mm-hmm. Like I wasn't doing the whole fever anymore. I just had trouble breathing. Mm-hmm. I could not walk in my apartment. I had to use a computer chair to push myself around in the apartment. Mm. I couldn't walk to the front door. I couldn't walk to the bathroom. I couldn't do walk in the kitchen. I had a computer chair most of the time pushing myself in. It. Wow. Mm. I lost sense of taste and smell. I couldn't smell anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a very common symptom. And one of the things that you said, which a lot of people did not initially um, attribute to COVID was the diarrhea. Because what happens is we have those receptors that that are not only, you know, people just think about your nose and, you you know, your mouth getting it, but those receptors go all the way down into your GI system. 
So, and that's why it said even after that, you could still be shedding virus through the stool. You know, you know that's why I was saying really make sure mm -hmm. the bathrooms are clean after and kind of have one place where you go. And why you couldn't get your fever down for a while, even though you were taking all these medications, it's the body's protective mechanism. It raises that temperature to try to fight the viruses off. So it's actually in there trying to do battle with this thing that's attacking your body. So as it's in there doing that, and we're like, oh, we're less taking the Tylenol and, the, and I'm not saying don't do that because I know when you get fevers, you can feel pretty crappy. Um, but that's what it's doing. Yes. So you lost your taste and smell. That's a lot of times your. Now, did you add any supplements during this time? Any vitamin C or? Anything? I was taking them. I'm just taking the one a day vitamins. You know the gummies that you can mm -hmm. eat for women. I was taking those. I felt like nothing I was doing was working. Like absolutely nothing. Now, were it you taking just... the one a day before, or you started them during that time? Yeah, I was taking it before. I was taking vitamins before this happened. But just the one a day, right? Nothing? Yeah. Okay. Just the one a day. I wasn't taking anything else besides that. I was like, well, okay, this this can... I don't know what... At first, I was confused on what I should be doing. It was like, well, you know, you can't go outside. And the hospital had gave me instructions. Like, you know, once your O2 stats start dropping into the 80s, that's when you need to come back to the hospital so you can be admitted. And I'm like, huh? I'm like, my O2 stats don't drop until I walk. So you did you have a pulse ox at home to check your O2 stats? I did. Now, was that given to you by the hospital or did you have to purchase it? I had to purchase it on my own. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm glad you were able to get that. So as long as you were sitting still, you, your O2 stats were okay. But with any kind of activity, that's when your sats yeah. would drop? Every single time. I would be 97 when I'm just sitting there or just laying there. Mm -hmm. But if I even roll over, it would drop down to 92. Mm, okay. Did you ever get into the 80s or no? No, I never got into the 80s. The lowest I got was like 90 and 91. That was okay. it. And how long did all of this last for you? A month. Wow. You know, normally they say it lasts for 14 days. Even after probably like three weeks after it happened, mm -hmm. I still had pneumonia. Mm -hmm. My x-rays were still showing that I had pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And what people don't be realizing, COVID looks just like pneumonia on an x-ray. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They, You can't tell the difference between the x-rays. And it's like, that's me and that's me okay they, but i shouldn't have it no more it was like but you still got pneumonia <laughs> okay and you had pneumonia in both of your lungs were you ever on oxygen at all no okay not at all thank god mm -hmm. now you you mentioned also that your aunt and your mom um were contracted and i know they had good outcomes too as well and you said they were not as sick yes. as you so no, they only had fatigue. Uh, my mom had, I think she was just in the bed for a couple of days and my aunt was very tired. Mm -hmm. And she was, you know, been to bed for a few days as well. My niece at the time was three and she had absolutely no symptoms. No symptoms. No cough, no fever, no nothing. Well, that's good that she did so well. Um, and a lot of times their immune system, you know, they, they, it's, a, it's much better at that point, unless they've had some issue that was immune compromised for them. But, and I think that's where a lot of the information was coming out. But, you know, we do know that kids, even at as young as three, even as babies can be COVID positive and can have significant outcomes. So it's not just, you know, I thank God yeah. that um, all of your family ended up well. And I know your family very well. You, you know, um, <laughs> one of your aunts is my best friend. <laughs> we did some Matter stuff fact, back in the day. <laughs> yeah. You're the reason why I have not named this. Huh? You actually was a part of naming me. <laughs> Well, yeah, your mom named you. I just, I just was showing, giving out some names. Your mom named you. I, did, 
I just I still don't it. understand why. <laughs> Talk to your mom. Talk to your mom about that. So we talked about the contract pacing and all of that. So and you said it took you about a month. We talked about your worst days. How did you deal with the mental stuff that was going on while you were isolated by yourself and had no support? And then also your family was testing positive and you guys not only were physically distanced, socially distanced, you know, but now you're dealing with this by yourself and still worried about them. How did you deal with that stress? cried a lot like I literally cried because me and my mother are very close and the fact that I was getting like really really sick that scared me and I'm like I'm young and she's older and she has more health issues than me and I was literally like God just let me take the brunt of it I take the brunt of it you don't have to have them have the brunt of it just let me take the brunt of it I'm okay with taking the brunt of it me and my mom talked every single day she called and checked on me make sure i was okay i called to check on her make sure she was okay i prayed a lot mm -hmm. i called my grandma and my aunt and we prayed a lot mm -hmm. that's what pretty much so kept me from going crazy yeah and i know it was about a month is and a praying half, family yeah, it was about a month and, and a few days after i got ready to see my mom again i was able to see her mm -hmm. Like it, it was the difficult, the most difficult part was I'm home and I don't know what to do. And I'm just pretty much so scared to death because I got pneumonia over here. And I've been hearing stories of people saying they got, you know, pneumonia and they've been put on ventilators. And once you get on that ventilator, it's hard to get off. Mm -hmm. And that's what really scared me. Mm -hmm. So even though you had this fear, you turned that around by um the positive affirmations that you spoke in the beginning like you're not so worried you'll be okay but you said something that really impacted me just now that your concern was more for your mom because she was older and had more issues and you didn't want her to suffer and you were willing to say let me take all of that did you feel somehow responsible for them testing positive even though they were going to walmart and doing all of those things that you feel like you were the one that caused them to a test positive i i really did i actually apologized to my mom and i cried to her telling her that's why i was telling you i didn't want to be around you guys because i literally tried not to go to their house because i knew i was working in that environment and we had started seeing a number of people probably like hundreds of people come in a day saying they wanted to be tested for this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I knew I exposed them to it because of my job. I'm like, you get it from me. And I literally couldn't accept that part. That's the part that hurt the most that I actually got them sick. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I didn't want my mom to, I feared losing my mom and I feared losing my aunt. I was like, this is this is some real stuff here what i'm experiencing if so if i'm experiencing this they might experience this too and i know if i'm i'm young and i'm feeling scared i know my mom is scared mm -hmm. but very, she never said it. very brave and i wasn't worried about nothing but just okay let god just let me take the brunt of it i'm okay if i can take the brunt of it let me take all the pain i'm like just keep my mom and my aunt safe that's all i want Hmm. That's, that's very noble. And I, I mean, I can understand that, you know, um, your love for your parents and your family. And, um, and that's the whole reason why I appreciate you coming on here, sharing your story, because I think a lot of millennials, um, you know, and even some of the Gen X's and younger, you know, have the sense like, oh, I'm not worried about it. And because they see other things that's happening in the world, like, oh, well, the president got it and he, he's fine. He got some medicine, he'll be okay. And people just have not realized that, you know, some of the levels treatment that you got because you work in urgent care and some things you know, and you know, you're in that community, how you said your area was impacted very heavily with COVID during that time. Did you hear stories of other people, maybe in your age range and stuff like that, that didn't have the best outcomes or that ended up in the hospital? Yes. Yes, my coworker had it first and she's younger than me. 
Mm-hmm. And she was in the hospital for about four days with hers. Mm-hmm. And after she left the hospital, after she got rid of COVID, she basically became a uh, having asthma. She never had asthma before in her life. Now she has asthma. So she had, that was her outcome. Because I know somebody and I'm hoping to get her on to do the last interview. And she, you know, she got a lot of scarring in her lungs after COVID. Um, and she now mm-hmm. has to be on oxygen. Um, and she's doing better little by little, but like you said, with any kind of activity, she needs to be on oxygen. So, um, I mean, I, I truly understand that. So what have you done differently now, health-wise, um, than you were doing before COVID? How has that changed you? COVID basically made me wake up and say, okay, I'm going to need you to stop this. So I've now taken all precautions. Now I am controlling my diabetes. I've changed in the way I eat. I've changed the things that I've drink. I literally just said, okay, you, you got to get this under control. So I started doing more dieting, exercising more, just trying to be healthy more. Mm-hmm. and get off the medications yeah and and you know that one of the things that you got and being so young um those are easily lifestyle modification things that you can do that you know even if you don't come up all of your medication can lower your need or medication and optimize your health a little bit better and the exercise is optimal um it, it will help you know with lung health it helps with your emotional health your physical health, and it definitely will exercise actually reduce um, the amount of blood sugar that you need to um, process in your body because it just actually helps all all around, and it helps with our blood pressure. Um, exercise is just phenomenal, and it doesn't have to be you know like an hour you know like full impact aerobics. Even just walking in your neighborhood, getting out and getting some fresh air and fresh sunshine. Um, and I know as the winter months come in. Um, people be a little bit more indoors and stuff like that. So the other thing I would definitely want to make sure is, do you know what your vitamin D level is? Are you on any kind of supplements now? I am on vitamin D. Um, I used to take vitamin D long years ago, but I am back on vitamin D Mm -hmm. just because I wanted to be on to actually say, because I don't get a lot of sun as as it is now. I stay in the house a lot. Mm -hmm. So I literally say, okay, I'm going to just go ahead and take these vitamin D pills. And you know, that's really, really good because um, uh, vitamin D typically has been found to be lower, much lower in the African-American population, especially because we have the melanin on our skin. But now even as we come into winter and you know, we're not gonna be out as much, mm-hmm. be a little bit more indoors. But the one thing that came out of one of the COVID studies that I read was that it didn't matter what race you were, what they found that was the mortality rate was higher for those people who had lower vitamin D levels. So I'm preaching vitamin D. Vitamin D kind of like your thermostat. So you know how your thermostat in your home, if you're too cold, you turn it mm-hmm. up to the heat. If you're too hot, you put the AC on and you turn it down to kind of balance things out. And that's, think about, that's what vitamin D kind of does in your body. So in addition to those supplements and stuff like that. So that's, that's definitely. So what, are there any lingering issues for you since you had COVID? Yes, I started experiencing COVID hair. My hair was coming out by the clunks. Hmm. Probably like, probably like maybe four, probably four weeks after I went back to work, I started experiencing really bad hair loss. Mm-hmm. Like I would brush my hair or brush my hair and chunks of my hair was in the brush. Mm-hmm. That's how terrible it was. And then I started experiencing COVID toes where my skin on my toes would shed. Mm-hmm. Like I can literally just pull it off and it was shedding. Okay. And they were like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, it's that COVID stuff. Ever since I had COVID-19, I started experiencing all this stuff. I never had it happen. My hands started shedding as well. I was like, this is kind of creepy. I literally tried to do everything I could to stop it from happening. My hair, I ended up cutting my hair a lot because Mm -hmm. 
it had came out so bad and I didn't know what was going on. And that, and I, I'm not sure. That's the first time I'm hearing about it. It could have been a uh, medication reaction too as well. Um, but I know the COVID toes has definitely been associated with um, COVID. So, wow. Is that still continuing since that's been a few months now? The toes, yes, but the hair, no. Once I end up cutting majority of my hair off, mm -hmm. it, it stopped coming out. Okay. Okay. Awesome. 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 So what is your main message now that you've dealt with COVID, your family has dealt with COVID, and um, you've come out on the other side, thankfully, um, you know, still intact with your health and being able to get back to your, your workplace and do all that. What's your message for the other millennials out there? Wear a mask. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you think you cannot get. Um, yeah, I'm going to need you to wear a mask. Masks are your friends no matter what you hear, no matter what other people tell you. Take it serious because I was that person that was naive and didn't take it serious at first. I literally was like, nah, whatever. I'm get it if I get it. I don't, I don't. Mm -hmm. Now, when I see people, young people without a mask on, I literally say, where's your mask at? You need to put on a mask. Mm -hmm. I go into the grocery store and, and, you know, the checkout girl, she literally had a mask on her face, but it wasn't above her nose. Mm -hmm. And I tell her, would you please put that mask above your nose? Yeah, I see a lot of people doing that, um, wearing the mask, but, you know, the nose is exposed. And, um, you know, that's not, yeah, so that's good. That's yeah. excellent. Very good. Even with my family, they think, you know, you wear gloves. I, I actually demonstrated to them what gloves mean when you wear it out in public and then you come back home after everything you just touched is contaminated. Mm -hmm. I'm like, stop wearing the gloves. Mm -hmm. Wash your hand, get hand sanitizer, and that's it. That Very will good. keep you from getting it there. Because I'm good. like, you sitting here putting these gloves on and you just picked up something that was contaminated and then you put it in a bag or something and the whole bag is contaminated. Mm -hmm. And then you put your hand in your purse with those gloves on Everything in your purse is contaminated. Then you put, take the gloves off and put your hand towards your face, contamination. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, stop wearing those gloves. Wow. Just don't wear them at all. Mm -hmm. I tell my cousins, you know, if you're going out of town, you're going out of state, please be mindful of other people because everybody will not tell you they have COVID-19 and they will sit there and expose you to it. Other uh, countries have it worse than we do. Be careful. I'm like, every little cough is not COVID-19. Right. <laughs> I literally have to tell that to patients now at work. We literally get up to 100 calls a day mm -hmm. asking for COVID-19 testing. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And we're in a small urgent care. We have three urgent cares. And every single day, we get over 100 calls in each clinic about COVID-19. Wow. Wow. Yes. It sounds like there's still it's a lot like, of education that needs to be done. And um, so I am so grateful to you um, and sharing your story with me and uh, allowing me to uh, broadcast it out to other people so that they can understand that even though you, you had your worst days, you know, you utilize those things that you didn't know, you, you stayed isolated while you were there, you stayed in contact, even though you were isolated from your family by distance, you stayed connected to them um, through phone communication and you used your faith and your prayer to kind of help pull you through this. And then on the other side of this, you said, okay, now I need to really make some changes and focus on some things that um, can make me healthier and um, get off. Yeah. So those are really great goals and I do applaud you. Um, great, thank you. great, great, great. I, and I, just phenomenal. I really appreciate your depth um, of what you went through and being able to communicate that and you know, your concern for your family and just saying, you know, let me, even now, very noble, just let me take the brunt God so that they don't be impacted because their health is worse than mine. That's very noble of you. Even though now I test positive for the antibodies in my body, mm -hmm. I still am precautious about when I come around my family or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I normally spray myself with Lysol if I come straight from work to the house. Mm -hmm. I literally get out my car 
and spray myself down with Lysol and I put my work shoes in my trunk. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. I tell them, <laughs> just because you have the antibodies in your body don't mean you can't get it again. I'm like, exactly. you can get COVID and as many things, times as you can. One of the things that I've heard about the antibodies, and I don't know if this is to be because I, I, it wasn't scientific data, just something I read. And they're not sure like how long the antibodies actually last. And um, that's one of the questions around the vaccine that they're potentially developing is that will there need to be more than one dose because you may not build up um, immunity to it with the one dose. And so that's some of the things with the antibodies is that how long does the antibodies actually last? That was a question. Well, I took oh. my test in, I took my antibody test in July uh -huh. and it was positive. Mm -hmm. And I took one again, probably like three weeks ago and it's still positive. Good. Very good. Very good. Well, any questions for me? No, ma'am. Well, I, I just, just want my millennials to actually take it serious. Don't listen to what people that are not in the medical field say. I need you to listen to what the doctors say. Uh -huh. If the doctors tell you, if a doctor and a nurse tell you this, trust me and believe it. They know what they're talking about. Don't sit there and listen to people mm -hmm. that ain't never been in the medical field. You mm -hmm. need to listen to somebody else. Absolutely. Because I don't care if you think this, even if you don't have, you, you cannot be a carrier. Somebody else close to you can get it. Mm hmm so very I'm like, good. be mindful of the other people. Very good, very good. So I am so appreciative of your time today. And um, we've been on here for about 40 minutes. So we went a little bit over, but it's all good. So okay. um, continued blessings to you, health and healing to you as you continue on your journey. And um, I know you're in our group. Um, and so we're actually getting a little bit more ramped up to be delivering our information to you. So um, all the best to your okay. family. I send them my love. And um, all thank right. you so much for sharing, okay? You're welcome. All Bye. right. God bless. Okay.